Now, and while you're considering why they would have done this, it does serve some economic interests. And you all probably know me, if you know me at all well, I'm a big believer in free enterprise and I'm a big supporter of what's needed to make sure that we have a thriving economy and that we leave folks free in order to develop that economy to the best of their ingenuity and ability. But I think it's a little bit unfair when some narrow economic interests want to purchase their advantage at the expense of something so vital to the identity and security of our whole people. That's not right. That's not fair, and that's not safe. Folks have talked tonight, rightly, about how incongruous it is on several levels that in the midst of the struggle we are now waging with the International Terror Network, and that has taken various forms, including, we are told, the form of, of the effort that we are making on behalf of self-government and liberty in Iraq. I think it's kind of incongruous, don't you, that we should be putting forth such a maximal effort, sending our young men and women over there to risk their lives and spill their blood and risk also, by the way, their, their psychological well-being and their spiritual well-being in the midst of horrors terrible as hell. I, I think it's kind of in Congress that we're asking all this of our, of our folks and our soldiers and our, our young people to defend and maintain and sustain the self-government of the people in Iraq. And meanwhile, we are being told that we don't have the right to defend the integrity of the identity and the borders and the self-government of our own people. And this, and in case, and in case President G.W. Bush is a little uh, finding it a little hard to understand why so many people who voted for him and kind of like him in various ways would be standing up all excited with him about this is because we don't understand. Standing all firm in defense of liberty over there. And meanwhile, over here, we are sacrificing that which is the physical prerequisite of liberty. You can't have freedom in principle if you won't defend it in fact. And if we let our borders collapse, the facts that support our freedom will be gone and you know it. And that's where we are. But it's not just the president. Other folks seem to have gone down this road in the Congress on both sides of the aisle. Because even though I want to give deference to the majority of folks still in the Republican congressional delegation, before anybody tries to stigmatize the Republican Party as the party won't defend our borders, and stuff, I see a majority of our congressional delegation trapped in a situation where a minority of Republicans joining with the Democrats is betraying the interests of our country. Right? We need to keep this in mind. And what are these people doing it for? Well, you and I both know, first thing they're doing it for is money. See? So some people can make money at the expense of the whole people's best interests. So some people will be able to have cheap labor. Now, I can understand why any particular businessman might want to lower his, uh, his mar uh, cost margins and increase his profit margins by getting cheaper labor. This makes sense from a certain narrow point of view. Uh, but, but tell me something. Uh, do you think that we ought all of us to pay in the coinage of burdened infrastructure and higher taxes and other things while folks are taking money and putting it into their private purse? and we bear the public consequences of what they're doing? Do you think that's right? Because I have my problems with it myself. I don't think it's rightly fair. I also kind of wonder, too, about the truth. I have spent a lot of time in the course of my career, did, looking at the problems of development in countries that are poor countries. And I'm glad that uh, Carmen stood up and reminded us that, that we ought to be really careful about this notion that Mexico is a poor country. Mexico is a country that has a lot of poor people in it. But if you look over the history of Mexico, you will find that one of the reasons Mexico has a lot of poor people in it is because there's a handful of rich people in Mexico standing on the necks of their poor to keep them from having opportunity, to keep them from developing enterprise, to keep them from being able to share in the great wealth that could be generated in Mexico. And I have found that same pattern repeated in country after country after country, where the reason there are so many poor is because the few rich will not respect the dignity and the rights and the liberty of the great majority of the people. 
And now they want to come to us and look at what we've accomplished through a system that allows us to stand tall and stand strong and build our associations and organize so that we don't have to be oppressed by a few, but can stand together as the whole people of this country to defend our interests. And they want us to pretend that that isn't what has made us strong and wealthy and given us the base for prosperity that we have. Well, I, for one, believe that it is. And it's about time we stop allowing folks to make us feel guilty about our success, so guilty that we are willing to throw away the prerequisites that made it possible. And that's what we will do. And that's what we will do if without some care for the culture of liberty, for the assimilation of the kind of values and discipline that's needed to sustain it, we start admitting tens of millions of people to residence and citizenship without really looking carefully at making sure that they mean to become not just exploiters of American wealth, but participants in the great American experiment of self-government. And, and, and some of our leaders don't seem to care about this because all they want to talk at us about is economics. I think economics is very important. But I think we need to remember that liberty has made successful economics possible in America. And if we sacrifice the Constitution and the representative government and the culture of liberty that has allowed us to stand strong as a people governing ourselves, then our economic prosperity will go too. And this immigration issue includes one of the symptoms of that. Because, um, hmm, let me think about it. They keep telling us that these folks are coming in and do jobs Americans won't do. And, and you and I both know that, that really what they're saying is that these people are coming in to do jobs at a wage that a lot of Americans wouldn't accept. <laughs> See? Oh. Now, now, does it strike you as fair that after spending all this time building and defending a country in which we can sustain a certain quality of life, in which we've been able to work out a system where we don't allow a wealthy few to keep the wealth from circulating into the hands of all the people who helped to produce it, do you think after working so hard to produce that result, we should stand by and allow an immigration policy that has as its explicit purpose the objective of cheapening labor in this country? Have we lost our minds? I really don't understand what's going on. And when I listen to folks tell me that there are some union leaders championing the cause of illegal immigration, I just scratch my head. Uh, I suppose these are folks who sort of feel like if we all get into a situation of oppression again, we'll feel like we have more need of them. See, but I frankly would like to celebrate the idea that working together we can make life better in this country and that we don't have to do it by making us all so miserable first. Hmm? But that is part of what has motivated folks, slavish service to these narrow special economic interests while ignoring the broad and clear interests shared by our whole people in maintaining and bettering, not lowering, the quality and standard of life in America. And I have to tell you from firsthand experience, this is a quality and standard of life that, that a lot of people around the world either envy or, or resent. And that's not just folks in poor countries, as they say. I, I can remember listening to folks in Europe getting on their high horse talking about how Americans are too well off and we're too pampered and we ought to be paying more for gas and we ought to have these big houses. You know, that most Americans get used to a certain square footage around them that people in Europe would die of envy to have. And, and yet, we think that they're going to be over there applauding us and thinking, well, no, they're saying, let's drag them down to our level. So when you hear these politicians talking about internationalism and globalism, you might keep this in mind. When you are the exceptional country, that kind of globalism could mean that you're going to be brought down to the lower standard that is the rule for most humanity. And I don't believe this is supposed to be our destiny. The kind of hope we have responded to is not that we're going to be a city on the same plane as everybody else, but we shall be that city on the hill which raises the hopes, raises the aspirations, raises the ambition of humanity. This is what we have done. This is what we should do in the future. And we should not now be induced to abandon this mission. <laughs>